There we go. Okay. I don't have to talk as loud then either. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about what mental health is, what it isn't, um, warning signs to look out for, and then just some basic ways of how to take care of your brain too, because that's probably the most important thing, right? So let's start about talking about why, why we should care about this. You know, there's lots of different majors represented in here too, right? Not all of you are going to go into a field that deals with mental health, correct? You know, we have some teachers, we have other different kinds of majors. So why should you guys care about mental health and mental health conditions? Well, we all need to start caring about mental health, mental health conditions, because it affects all of us. It's a ripple effect. When someone has a mental health condition in their family, it never just affects that one person. It affects the entire family, so therefore it affects the entire community too. One thing that I always like to point out is that depression and anxiety disorders cost the global economy $1 trillion every year in lost productivity. That's trillion with a T. That's more money than back injuries, wrist injuries, shoulder injuries combined. That's huge, isn't it? So we really need to start paying attention to this and start actually doing something about this too. Other numbers I like to point out too is that most symptoms of mental health conditions show up between the ages of 14 and 24. So a lot of you in that, this room are around that age, right? Between the ages of 14 and 24, that's when most symptoms show up. So we really need to be aware of that too. And another really scary thing is that there's usually an 11 year gap between when symptoms first show up and when someone goes and actually gets help to address those symptoms. And half the people with symptoms never go get help at all. That's somebody with a medical condition, because that's what mental health conditions are. Someone with a medical condition that never ever goes and gets help for that medical condition. Another one, 50 to 75% of youth in the juvenile justice system have a diagnosed medical condition. I'm stressing the word diagnosed because I really truly believe it's higher. That's just my opinion. Because one of the other things I've done in my life is I've worked a lot in the juvenile justice system and in the justice system in general in Minnehaha County over in Sioux Falls. And I would have to say 95% of the kids that I worked with have a mental health condition, something going on there, and they're self-medicating. Because when I asked them, you know, hey, why, why were you smoking weed? First thing they say, well, it's the only thing that shuts my head off. Or why did you start drinking? Well, it's the only thing that worked to make me feel better. To me, that tells me that they're self-medicating. So I would say that number, 50 to 75% is much higher. They're just not diagnosed. So we really, more evidence that we need to start paying attention to this. So how, what can we do? Well, we recommend a three-pronged approach. Education, working to reduce the stigma, and promoting wellness. Let's start with education. Now, we all know education is important, right? Obviously, because you're all here. You're all here increasing your education. So you all value education. We know that. So let's start by talking about the difference between mental health and mental health challenges. When you hear the phrase mental health, what do you think about? Chances are the first things that pop into your mind are depression, anxiety, ADHD, PTSD, and so on. So often when we hear the phrase mental health, we immediately think mental illness. The diagnoses, labels, pills, and therapies that are meant to treat disorders of the brain. In our society, the two terms are often used interchangeably, or they're considered opposites of one another, like two ends of the same spectrum, like this. This representation suggests that if you're not mentally ill, then you must be mentally healthy. Yet, by definition, health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. So, mental health is not the same as mental illness, nor is it the opposite of mental illness, as this graph might suggest. There's more to experiencing physical, mental, and social well-being than not being mentally ill. So then, what is mental health? 
let's consider the idea that we all have a state of mental health that changes across our lifetimes, despite the presence or absence of mental illness. Mental health is continually affected by many different factors. Genetics, relationships, family, physical health, communities, and even government policies. Your mental health ebbs and flows based on the interaction of all these factors. The more these interactions add up to positive influences, the more likely you'll experience what we call optimal mental health. Optimal mental health is reflected in productive activities, fulfilling relationships with others, and the ability to adapt to change and cope with adversity. Conversely, we can experience poor mental health when the interactions of our genes, relationships, communities, and so on add up to negative influences. In these situations, we might experience less productive activities, unfulfilling or unhealthy relationships with others, and challenges in adapting to change and coping with adversity. Because mental health changes across the lifespan and exists despite the presence or absence of mental illness, a clearer way to think about mental health is to consider two dimensions. This model suggests that mental health and mental illness are not opposites on the same spectrum, but rather related and interactive states. For example, a person can experience anywhere from serious mental illness to no symptoms of mental illness. And at the same time, that same person can also experience anywhere from poor mental health to optimal mental health. Let's consider some examples. So yes, let's consider some examples. I like to use myself as an example because, you know, I've been told that I think the world revolves around me. <laughs> so let's use me as an example. As I said before, I have a mental health condition. I have depression and anxiety, okay? My depression and anxiety is, it isn't on the severe end of that line. It's more towards the no mental illness line, kind of a little bit towards the middle. My mental illness is pretty well controlled. I'm on medications. I can function pretty well. I can work. Um, I have healthy relationships, those kinds of things. So I'm probably, you know, right in the middle of that line there, okay? My mental health, I'm more towards the top on the optimal mental health. I exercise, I eat right, I have a really good healthy support system. I've gone to counseling, I still go to counseling when I need to. I've learned healthy coping skills in counseling. I've learned what to look out for, my triggers in counseling. I learned what to do when those happen in counseling. So my mental health is more towards the top of the optimal mental health. Now, every single person in this room has mental health. Because if you have a brain, you have mental health. And every person in this room has a brain, right? Yeah? Can we all agree on that? Sometimes we don't always use our brains, but we all have a brain, right? So therefore, we all have mental health. And that mental health, that can go up and down pretty easily sometimes. We can control that. We can control how we take care of ourselves, the people we surround ourselves with, what coping skills we learn, all of that stuff can control our mental health. Now, mental illness or mental health conditions, those terms are interchangeable. We like to use the word mental health conditions. That's more person-first language. Those, if you're on that line, that's a diagnosed medical condition, if you're on that line. You don't usually move on that line as easily or as quickly if you're on that line. So if you're, not every person is on that line. But on that line, you can still be on that line and have good mental health. Or you can have poor mental health and be on that line. Let's take my brother for an example. My older brother, he doesn't have a diagnosed mental health condition at all. But about three years ago, he lives in Minneapolis. He showed up at my mom and dad's farm. They live up by Watertown. My mom calls me and she's like, hey, your brother's here. So I'm like, well, that's kind of weird, you know, that he just shows up out of nowhere. I go out there to their farm. He was a hot mess. I don't know how else to say it, but he was a hot mess. You could tell he had gained weight. He looked horrible like he hadn't slept in a long time. He was crying. He just was, he hadn't shaved. He just looked horrible. And we were like, what, what is going on? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I think my wife is cheating on me. My business is falling apart. My girls, I don't know what's going on with them. 
like, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Everything is falling apart. Well, he was obviously experiencing really poor mental health at that point in his life. So we came around as a family and we helped him. We helped him get into counseling. We helped him connect with positive people around him. He connected with better friends. He got back with a pastor he was really close with. Spirituality was important to him. So he reconnected with that. He started eating better. He started exercising. He stopped drinking alcohol. And now he has good mental health. His mental health got better. But he was never diagnosed with a mental illness at all. So really, it's important to remember that mental health is simply the health of our brains. And everyone has mental health. And that can ebb and flow. Mental health conditions are a medical problem that affects the way your brain functions. And therefore, it can affect the way a person thinks and acts. The behavior that you might see if someone has a mental health condition, that is a symptom of your brain not working right. Just like when you have asthma and you have a hard time breathing, you know, that's a symptom of your lungs not working right, right? Someone has asthma. Well, sometimes the behavior someone might exhibit when they have a mental health condition, that's a symptom of their brain not working right. And it can be hard, and that can be frustrating, and that can be really difficult to understand, too. So what are some of those warning signs? Well, here's some of those warning signs. Now, you guys might be looking at these warning signs and be thinking, oh my gosh, I have some of these warning signs. But you know what? A lot of these can be just normal human emotions, normal human behaviors. What we look for in warning signs is we look for three things. How long do they last? How intense are they? And do they stop you from doing things you normally would do in your life? So let's take sleep for an example. It's perfectly normal that, you know, maybe you've had a real intense week, like next week is finals week, right? Yeah? Okay, that week is going to be intense, right? Yeah? You probably are going to be studying a lot and might not get a lot of sleep. So maybe the week after that or after you've had a few tests in a row, you might be tired after that. That's normal to happen. Or you might be so stressed out and worried about finals that you might not sleep well a night or two. That is normal. That's okay and that's normal to feel that way. When I'm talking about sleep changes as a warning sign, I'm talking about maybe you can't go to sleep every single night for a week or two. Every time you try to fall asleep, you have these thoughts racing through your head all of the time. And it's just like a freight train, boom, 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 going on in your head and you just can't seem to turn your head off. That's a warning sign. It's really intense. Or it can go the other way too. Maybe no matter how much you sleep, you are tired. You could feel like you could sleep for 10 days straight and you get up and you're still tired. And this goes on for a week or two and it just doesn't seem to go away. Or maybe you just feel so empty inside that nothing seems to make you happy anymore. Not, you just don't seem to care about anything anymore. It's just like, uh, whatever. Maybe you like to play video games, or you like sports, or I don't know, you like to watch Hallmark movies, you know, whatever it is, and you just don't care about any of that anymore. And it goes on for more than a couple days. That's a warning sign. Maybe every time you walk in a room, you're really convinced that everyone is thinking of talking about you. You know, why are they talking about me? Why does everyone hate me? Why did I screw that up? Why did I do so bad at that? And it's really intense, and it doesn't go away after a few days. That can be a warning sign, and you need to talk to somebody about that. And you know, the other thing about warning signs, too, is just because you might be experiencing some of these warning signs, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a mental health condition. There might be something else going on in your body, but you do need to talk to somebody. You need to talk to your doctor, you need to talk to a mental health professional to figure out what's going on. So let's talk about 
this word stigma. Have you guys heard of that word before? Stigma? Stigma is probably the number one reason why a lot of people don't go and get help for mental health conditions. You know, a lot of companies offer what they call EAPs, employee assistance programs. And once you guys get out into the real world, <laughs> you'll hear that. You know, your employer will say, well, you can go for 12 sessions for free or six sessions for free. All you got to do is ask. Well, you know, eight out of 10 employees won't use that service because of this stigma. Stigma is huge. We like to think of stigma in three different levels, like a tree. We think of it as a tree. Surface stigma is like the leaves of a tree. That's like the words that you might be saying that you don't necessarily think that what you're saying is harmful, but really it is harmful. Now we all know that, well, we'd probably, words do hurt. If you've ever been in an abusive relationship, you 100% know that words hurt and they hurt a lot. So let's think about what it would be like to live with a mental health condition or have a loved one with a mental health condition. And what you're hearing all the time around you are people saying things like, man, she's crazy, she's a nut job, or the weather's crazy, or that person did something bad, so they must be a nut job, or they must be crazy. Hearing words associated with mental health conditions used in a negative way all of the time. Do you think that perpetuates the negative stigma around mental health? Absolutely. Or saying things like they committed suicide. That makes it sound like they committed a crime. So we want to say things like they died by suicide. That's using person first language. So watching what we say and watching our words, and I'm guilty of it too, man. It's hard because it can be a habit, you know, saying, man, that was crazy. Instead, try saying things like it was really chaotic today. You know, instead of saying, well, the weather was really bipolar, oh, the weather was really up and down and up and down. So just watching your words, that can make a big difference. And then we have that shallow stigma. Those are those unspoken rules where we might be afraid and not want to talk about mental health. So let's take an example of that. Okay, let's say that you have a person that you usually sit next to in class a lot. Okay. We'll, we'll call him Joe. Anyone here named Joe? No? Okay. I pick on Joe all the time, so I don't know why. I just pick on Joe. Uh, but I want to make sure there's no Joe in here. Uh, so let, you have a, a guy you sit next to in class a lot. You kind of know him, kind of don't know him, you know, just an acquaintance. So you see Joe every, every time you go to this class. He's there, you know, you exchange pleasantries with him. Hey, how's it going? You know, blah, 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 blah. Well, he's there. All of a sudden, Joe's gone. He's gone for like a month. And you're like, well, that's kind of weird. You know, I wonder where Joe went. Well, then after a month, Joe comes back. And you're like, well, hey, where, are you? where were you, Joe? Joe's like, oh, man, I got really sick. You know, I got COVID. I ended up in the hospital. I was really sick. What would we, what would we say to Joe? You're like, you know, we might say, oh, dude, man, I'm sorry. That sucks that you got sick. <laughs> Don't cough on me, <laughs> you know. I'm sorry you got sick, you know. You need to borrow my notes or anything to catch up, you know, that kind of thing. We'd at least be, like, pleasant to him, right? We wouldn't feel weird talking about it at all. But Joe had a medical emergency. He had to go to the hospital. His lungs got sick, right? Yeah, not a big deal, Okay. Same scenario. Got a guy you sit next to in class all the time, Joe. You see him all the time. All of a sudden, he's gone. He's gone for like a month. Then he comes back. You're like, well, Joe, where were you? You know, I missed you. Where were you? He's like, oh, man, I was really struggling. I had to go to treatment for a month. Uh, geez, what do we say then? That'd be kind of awkward, wouldn't it? We wouldn't know what to say sometimes. It'd be like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to, like, you know, 
say something that might upset him. I don't, you know, it'd be like kind of weird. What do I say? It could be awkward, couldn't it? Well, you know, if you think about it, how's that any different from the first scenario? Joe's brain was sick. He went to a hospital, got treatment for his sick brain, and now he's back in school. Same kind of thing. He's telling you, he's open about it, he's telling you, same kind of thing. Hey, Joe, thanks for sharing that with me. Is there anything I can do to support you? That's how we get rid of that unspoken stigma. stigma. And then we have that deep stigma. That's those false, that false knowledge, you know, where we have that self-stigma, that societal stigma. That's things like health insurance will pay for you to go to the doctor as many times as you want, but will only pay for so many counseling sessions, you know, those real systemic issues like that. That's that real deep stigma. And it's that self-stigma. Self-stigma is where I say, I support you 100% that you're going to go to counseling. That is so cool. You are so brave. You know, mental health conditions are medical problems. There's nothing to be embarrassed about. I'll even make sure you have a ride. You are I'm awesome. Way to go. But I don't need counseling. I'm stronger than that. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can handle my own crap. I don't need, I don't need someone to help me deal with my stuff. That's called self-stigma. And that's a huge, huge thing, especially for guys. Self-stigma can be huge. And I know this because I raised two boys. Well, they're men now, but self-stigma is huge. And let me tell you, I'm going to tell you my son's story instead of going through some of this other stuff because I think it's important for you to hear that. My son is 32 years old, and I know you're all going, well, you look too young to have a 32-year-old. <laughs> but yes, he is 32 years old. Um, when he was 14 years old, that year, he played in 152 basketball games. Yes, that is a lot of basketball games. I know, how's that? Every one of them. He played in a varsity, the varsity team, the JV team, the freshman team, and he played club ball on weekends. He said he liked being that busy. Okay? What I didn't know is the reason why he liked being that busy. Okay? This is a guy, straight A student, popular in high school. He's six foot five, so I mean, and obviously he was a good athlete. He liked being that busy because when he wasn't busy and he'd try to go to sleep or try to settle down and not do something, he was having these thoughts going through his head, coming at him like a freight train. Just boom, 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 boom. And they scared him because he didn't know how to handle it. He didn't know what to do with it. He just knew he wanted it to stop. And he didn't know how to make it stop. And him, you know, being a big jock, being a guy, he didn't want to ask for help. He was afraid to ask for help because he thought it would make him look weak. And he thought it would make him look like he couldn't handle his own stuff. So he didn't know what to do. So he tried to handle it himself. So what he did was he smoked weed. Because, you know, he smoked weed, it made everything stop for a while while he was high. But then when he was sober, came back. The thoughts came back, the not being able to calm himself down, all that came back. So then he'd have to smoke more weed. And it just became a cycle. Smoke more, make it go away, sober, come back. Then he started drinking. Same kind of thing. Had to smoke more, had to drink more, had to smoke more, had to drink more. Then, of course, he started getting in trouble because stuff catches up with you, man. You know? And then he couldn't afford it. You know, that's expensive. That can get expensive, especially when you're smoking that much. So he started selling to support his habit. Well, guess what happened? But you can guess what happened. He got caught. He got caught selling. So then he caught a felony. So, yeah, that was bad. And it still follows him to this day. And then he also got a substance developed a substance use disorder too, which that's a fancy way of saying addiction. So he had all this stuff going on. 
And it, he had gone through treatment three times and been on probation twice before anyone ever asked, hey, is there some kind of mental health thing going on with you? And then finally when that happened, we were able to get him on some medications to deal with the mental health stuff, but by that time, you know, he had a substance use disorder and was addicted to things. And then he started using harder drugs and harder drugs too. This year, December 19th of this year, he's 32 years old now. Through all of this stuff, he finished college on his own without any financial aid because, you know, when you get a felony, you can't. That's not an option for you anymore. But he ended up finishing college, working and getting money to do that. He has a very successful career, makes a lot of money, owns his own house. But during all this time, he was still struggling and having a hard time. December 19th of this year, he almost died of an overdose. I'll never forget that day. He showed up at my house the next morning and was a mess because he had almost died the night before. And that was a horrible, horrible weekend because we worked really, really hard to get him into treatment. But it was a blessing, too, because we were able to get him into treatment and get him the help that he needs. And I have never in my entire life seen anyone so brave and so strong to make that decision to go and get help that I saw that six foot five 270 pound man go and get help you know and that's the thing about mental health conditions a lot of people will say you're weak you can't handle your own stuff and you ask for help it's the opposite I don't know anyone that has a mental health condition that is weak. Every single person I know with a mental health condition, they are the strongest stinking people I know. Because we never fake being sick. We fake being okay. We fake it to get through the day a lot of times. And that takes a lot of strength and a lot of perseverance. So we don't, we're strong and we have courage and I tell you what, my son is one of the strongest, most courageous people I know. And knock on wood, I don't know if there's wood, um, but he's over 130 days sober now. And it's, I'm thankful and blessed and happy every single day to have him back. And it's just amazing to see the change that that made. But you know what? It all started because he wouldn't ask for help. And we didn't know those warning signs. Because the earlier you can get to treatment, the better. Just like any other chronic health condition, the earlier you get to treatment, the better. Just like heart disease, just like diabetes. So if you have a feeling that something's not going right in your brain, ask for help and keep asking for help until you can find the help. And here's just some other ways that you can reduce that stigma. Because really reducing that stigma, that is the best thing that you can do to get that help. Talking about it. Talking about it is a really, really good way to reduce that stigma. Showing empathy. Do you guys know what empathy is? Yeah? The thing I want to point out about empathy, empathy is not fixing the problem for people. That is not empathy. Empathy is simply just being there for someone. We're not asking you to be a counselor for your friends at all. We're just saying, hey, go and be with your friend. If you think your friend is struggling and having a hard time, just show up and be there for them. You know, show up at their house and watch Hallmark movies with them, or show up and shoot hoops with them, or work on their car with them, or bring a pizza over. You know, bring a pizza and a six pack of pop over. You know, remember, I said pop. I'm not going to advocate for not good coping skills. So, you know, bring some water over. Do whatever. Just be there with your friend. That's all you have to do to show empathy. You don't have to have big, deep feelings conversations with your friend. Just be there. That is empathy. That's how you can be there with your friend. I'm going to skip this video because I want to talk 
a little bit about taking care of your brain. Now, I'm a huge science nerd, so this kind of stuff, and I also am kind of lazy, <laughs> so when they were ta people were talking about this kind of stuff, I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever, this touchy-feely kind of stuff. I don't know if I'm real motivated to do it because, you know, I'm lazy. Whatever. I need proof that this actually works before I'm going to, like, invest my time into doing this. But there is now proof that doing these wellness things and this protective stuff actually works and actually helps heal your brain. Because to put it in real simple terms, when something happens that isn't pleasant in your life, it forms unhealthy connections in your brain. So doing things like this can help heal those unhealthy connections in your brain. It can help rebuild those connections in your brain. And we have proof of that now. The more we learn about our brain, the more we're learning how to help our brain heal and help our brains get better. So let's just talk about some of these connections. Let's talk about problem solving for a minute. How I like to think about problem solving and knowing about problem solving is knowing when to see the forest and when to see the tree. Because sometimes you've got big, big, huge, huge problems that are really, really overwhelming, right? You're like, oh my God, I can't deal with this. In that point, you're going to need to step forward. The whole forest is going to seem really, really overwhelming. In that point, you're going to need to step forward and just focus on one tree at a time. And just look at that tree. Say, I'm just going to look at this tree and figure out this tree. Sometimes you're going to need to look at a leaf on that tree and figure that out. You know what? Sometimes that tree is going to be really overwhelming. And you're going to say, oh my cra holy crap, I can't handle this tree. This is too much for me. And then you're going to need to take a step back and focus on the big forest. Focus on the big picture. And it's knowing when to do which. When to focus on the big picture and when to focus on the individual thing. You're going to need to know when to do which. That is a really good protective factor and that can really help your brain. And then there's knowing resources. Do you guys have on-campus counseling here? Yeah? Knowing where that is, knowing where a doctor is. If you need to go to a doctor, knowing how to get to that doctor. All of those things are really, really important, knowing how to do that. Having positive peer relationships. Remember I said I worked in the juvenile justice system in Minnehaha County? Okay, I worked with adults and kids. They, most of them had two things in common. Okay, what do you think those two things were? That they were in trouble with the law, and most of them had two things that they had in common, reasons why they were in trouble. What do you think the number one reason why they were in trouble? Drugs, yep. Drugs and alcohol was the number one reason. Second reason were the people they were with. The people they surrounded themselves with. That was the number two reason why most of them were in trouble or got in trouble. So having those positive people around you is really important. So if you're finding yourself getting in trouble, having a lot of negativity in your life, look around you. Who am I hanging out with? Who am I surrounding myself with? That is really important. Change it if you can. Now I know it can get hard if it's family that's being that negative influence on you, but do what you can to change that. Because that is a big, big deal. Have you guys ever gotten a different car or a new car and then all of a sudden that's all you see? Is that kind of car? Yeah? That's a real thing. That is a real thing that your brain does. You have so much information coming at your brain all of the time that your brain has filters in it that filters out the things that aren't important to you. So you can control what your brain filters out and what is important for your brain. So that's why those things like vision boards and positive affirmations, that's how those things work. So you can control what your brain focuses on. 
So if you're having a lot of negativity in your life and you're just feeling like you're down all the time, try feeding your brain and telling your brain to focus more on positive things. Now this isn't going to stop bad things from happening, happening to you necessarily, but it will help how you react to that too. So control what your brain focuses on. And having a connection to your community, being involved in clubs and groups on campus, huge, huge thing, really important for your brain. How many of you know where your ancestors came from? Kind of? You know, that's important to know that. Having that connection to where you came from, where your family came from, your culture, that's important for you. That's important for your brain. Having a connection to somebody or something is really important. Find that out. Do that kind of thing. Having a safe environment. Have you guys ever studied ACEs or know what that means? Adverse childhood experiences? If you're a teacher, you might get into that and learn about that. Those are studies that have shown that kids living in traumatic homes and being involved in traumatic homes has a profound effect on the way the brain develops. So it's really important, and it goes for adults too, it's really important that if you're living in an unsafe environment, that you do what you can to get to a safe environment. There's places and people that will help you get there. Get to a safe place. And resiliency. We like to think of resiliencies with the three C's. Connection, coping, and competence. Connection is having those positive people around you. Having that positive support system around you. Having a trusted adult that you can go to. Now I know you all are adults, right? But I'm talking about just having someone that you can go to to talk to. I have a mentor, and I'm an old lady, okay? I have a couple mentors. I have people that I can call up and say, eh, I'm not sure about this, you know? Is this really okay or not okay? Or what do you think about this? What is your opinion about this? That's really important to have someone that you can trust to bounce ideas off of and to talk about that kind of thing with. It doesn't have to be a family member. It could be a family member. You know, but find someone you trust that you can talk to. Have connection with people. Have connection with somebody. And then coping. Learn those positive coping skills. Remember I said my mental health is okay most of the time because I've gone to counseling. When I went to counseling, I didn't go to counseling to talk about my feelings and that kind of stuff. What I learned in counseling, and this is just me, other people get every, something different out of counseling. Each individual does. What I got out of counseling was I learned coping skills. I learned how to cope with what I was feeling and what my brain was doing or not doing. I learned things like, okay, when my brain is spinning and I have these thoughts racing in my brain or I'm having a lot of negative thoughts, that's just my brain messing with me. These are things that I can do to help stop that from happening. You know, I like to run, so I can go out and run. When I can't physically do that, because I have other medical problems too, I need to find something that I can do that's not physical. I always tell people to have at least two ways to cope with your stuff. One physical and not, one not physical too. So I have two different things to, to cope with stuff. Um, competence. Competence means knowing and understanding your body and how your body is feeling. So an example with the, of that would be, you know, I'm sitting at my desk and I'm typing and oh, it's kind of a nasty email <laughs> that I'm typing and I can feel my shoulders get tight and I can feel my jaw get tight. I'm stressed. I can feel myself getting stressed. This means I'm feeling mad and I'm feeling stressed. Okay. I need to take a break and I need to calm down a minute. How many of us like totally ignore those physical cues? We are programmed to do that. We do. We ignore what our body is telling us and what our body is feeling because that's just what we do and what we've been taught to do. Um, sports, if you play sports, 
it's really important that you are tuned into your body and you know what your body's telling you and how your body is feeling. Because it helps you perform better when you can do that. So that's competence too. You increase those skills and you'll have better resiliency. You'll have a better, you'll be better at bouncing back from things when things happen. So let's talk about some of the things that you can do to cope with stress. What are some of the things you guys do to cope with stress? Go for a walk. What else? Lift weights. Physical activity is really, really good. Studies have shown, see, I told you I'm a science nurse, <laughs> nerd. <laughs> studies have shown. Uh, studies have shown that physical activity has a very, very good effect and positive effect on your brain, almost as good as taking medications. Now, I'm not telling you to go off medications if you're on medications, but physical activity is really, really good for your brain. What else? Yoga. I'm a huge yoga person. It helps you get in touch with your body, that competence piece. It helps you stretch out your body. It helps with breathing, too. Did you guys know that most people in our culture don't breathe right? Yeah? You know, you've been told we have bad diets and we don't exercise. Now I'm telling you, you don't breathe right. <laughs> most of us don't breathe right. We breathe too fast and we don't breathe deep enough. So learning how to breathe. What else do we do? Music. Music is a great one. How many of you listen to music when you're stressed? Absolutely. I'm going to be playing like loud music on my way back to Sioux Falls tonight to stay awake. <laughs> I'll tell you that. Um, how many of you have pets? How many of you wish you could have pets? But you can't because of where you're living. <laughs> pets are awesome. Pets are a great, great way to handle and to help your mental health too. Um... Journaling, talking to somebody, getting it out of your brain. Did you know that just talking to somebody, and it doesn't have to be a counselor, that helps heal those unhealthy connections in your brain. That helps your brain heal. So just talking about things that bother you, that are hard for you to handle, that helps your brain heal. So just talking to somebody, talking about what's happened to you, how you're feeling, those are all really good things that you can do. So let's take a minute here and let's practice a breathing thing. Since I told you you don't do it right, I should tell you how to do it, right? Yeah? Okay, so everyone sit up straight. Put your feet flat on the floor. Okay, I want you to close your eyes. Put your hand on your belly. And when you breathe, you're going to breathe deep enough that you're going to feel your, your hand move in and out when you breathe. Now you're going to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth when I tell you to. Now do the best you can. I do not want anyone to pass out. Okay? So when I tell you to, I want you to breathe in through your nose, in, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four, breathe in, two, three, four, breathe out, two, three, four, breathe in, two, three, four, and breathe out, two, three, four. Open your eyes. Okay, what you guys just did was a form of meditation. Okay? It's that easy. You do not have to sit in a room with weird music playing, with your legs crossed, going ohm. All right? Meditation can be that easy, and it has really good effects on your brain. And actually, we learned that technique from the sports psychologist for the Minnesota Vikings. So that is a technique that they teach to athletes all the time. And if you pay attention and watch, you know, the NBA playoffs are going on right now. And if, I don't know if you're watching that at all, but if you pay attention and look, 
you might actually catch some of those guys before they go into the game on the sidelines doing that, taking deep breaths. You might see them going, that kind of thing. That's what they're doing. That helps clear your, your nervous system, settle down your nervous system, and helps your body function better. And that's something you can do easily before you have to take a test, maybe after you get in an argument with somebody, um, any of those things. That helps calm your body down. Real, real simple thing that you can do. So any, I'm going to open it up to questions. Does anyone have questions for me at all? The other thing I want to make sure everyone knows and understands too is that mental health conditions are incredibly common. One in four people have a mental health condition. And most of the time you can't tell if someone has a mental health condition. When you walked in here tonight and I, you saw me over there, you had no idea I had a mental health condition, did you? No. It's an invisible illness. Most of the time you never know that someone is having a hard time. So the other thing I really encourage you to do is just to be nice to each other and to be kind to each other. And if you have a friend that maybe you think is blowing you off or whatever, don't assume that they're just maybe being mean to you. Reach out and help them or reach in to help them. I know when my son is struggling and having a hard time, it's impossible for him to reach out because all of his energy is going towards faking being okay during the day. So he doesn't have the energy to reach out for help. I have to reach in and help him. What I mean by that is doing things like saying, hey, you know what, I'm at Hy-Vee, can I pick you up a five pound bag of potatoes? You know, or I'm gonna just stop by and just see how you're doing. And just stop over and say, hey, how's it going? And not even have a conversation, because a lot of times he's too tired to even talk but just sitting there and watching TV or watching him play Madden or whatever it is, just being there means a lot. So just being kind to each other and nice to each other can go a long way. And then just talking openly and being able to talk openly about it can go a long way too. So any of the questions, anything? about starting clubs on campus? Um, well, you already did, lost and found. <laughs> That's what I would recommend. Doing something like that is amazing, and we are so, so happy that that has come to our area because that goes so long, such a long, long ways. We have come so far. I've been in social services for 30 years in this state, so I mean, I've seen such progress. We still have a long way to go, but I've seen such, such progress in how things are going and happening, and this is amazing what I'm seeing. And your generation, too, has come a long way and doing a lot, but we still have a long way to go. But just talking about it and being open about it is great. Um, at NAMI, we do have a program called Ending the Silence. That's where we go to schools. We go to middle schools and high schools, and we talk to kids about mental health in the warning signs and it really really helps to have someone your age come with us and talk about their own experience with mental health conditions and how it started and how they got better because the kids just really really relate to that because they can see firsthand that hey this is a normal looking person that has a mental health condition and they're doing normal things and that you know it's not a big deal, that kind of thing. So if you're ever interested in doing that, go to our website and look it up. And we train you, we teach you what to say, how to say it. We make sure that you're extremely comfortable before you go. We never ask you to do something you're not comfortable with doing. Plus, tip, as somebody who has done a lot of hiring in their life, it looks really good on a resume <laughs> to have that on there. Um, so that's a really good way to get involved too. And the young adult presenters too have said that it's absolutely rewarding for them to do that kind of work also. 
So let us know if that's something you're interested in doing too. The kids, man, they just eat that up. Um, I, I haven't been at one school yet, and I do, I do several hundred a year, where a kid has not come up to the young adult after a presentation and said, thank you for telling your story. Thank you, because I don't feel alone now. I have been feeling the same way. I've been feeling the same things. Thank you for saying and telling your story. You made a huge difference. So it's an amazing thing to see. So thank you guys for taking time out of your busy night. Good luck at finals next week. Um, good luck in whatever you decide to do, and let a, get a hold of us if you need anything, and get involved and stay involved in things like Lost and Found. Highly advocate for that. Um, and get, in, just get involved. So thanks, guys.